Did you know that a quiet village in North Yorkshire was the site of one of the UK's worst train disasters? On February 28, 2001, the Great Heck train crash shocked the nation and left a lasting mark on railway safety. This tragic event involved a speeding passenger train, a massive freight train, and a Land Rover in the wrong place at the wrong time. The collision resulted in a scene of unimaginable destruction and loss. Join us as we unravel the events leading up to this catastrophe, explore the heroic rescue efforts, and delve into the investigation that followed. Discover how a moment of human error led to a disaster that changed lives forever. This is the story of the Great Heck train crash, a train collision that will never be forgotten. The Great Heck is a small village of two-on-one people in North Yorkshire in the northeast of England. Located 247 kilometer north of London, and 31.5 kilometers east-southeast of Leeds. The town has no train station on its own, but relies mainly on the M62 motorway, which runs just north of Great Heck, for its traffic. It's part of the district of Selby, leading to this accident also being referred to as the Selby train crash. The East Coast Main Line, one England's main railway lines, also runs through the village north to south, crossing under the M62 in the process. Stretching 632 kilometers from London in the south to Edinburgh, Scotland in the north. The East Coast Main Line, ECML, is a train route with mostly two tracks, but the part from Peterborough to London has four tracks. It opened in 1850 and is a big north south route. This line is used by all kinds of trains local passenger trains, freight trains, and high speed intercity trains. Trains on this line can go up to 125 Vive or Mipoc, and they could go even faster if the signal system was improved. A 1986 Land Rover 110, later called the Defender, was traveling west on the M62 motorway. This midsize 4 arc 4 vehicle is 4.6 meters long and 1.79 meters wide, weighing 1.9 metric tons. The Land Rover was pulling a trailer carrying a 1986 Renault Savannah station wagon. This car is 4.64 meters long, 1.72 meters wide, and weighs 1.9 metric tons. An intercity 225 train operated by GNR, Great North Eastern Railway, was traveling south from Newcastle to London King's Cross Station. This high-speed passenger train used for long-distance trips in the UK was unit BN56. All IC225 trains have a fixed setup with a locomotive and 10 passenger cars. Named for their top speed of 225 kph, the IC225 was introduced in 1989 to take advantage of newly electrified lines and make long-distance travel more appealing. At the front of the train was a Mark IV DVT, driving van trailer, an unpowered car with a driver's cab to control the locomotive at the other end. Unlike most control cars, a DVT doesn't carry passengers, only the driver. Behind the DVT were two first-class cars, each 39.7 metric tons, a service car, and six second-class cars, five weighing 39.9 metric tons and one at 39.5 metric tons. Each first-class car can hold 46 passengers, while each second-class car has 72 seats. The last second-class car is slightly different inside because it doesn't connect to another car, which changes its weight. Pushing the train at the time of the accident, was a high-speed electric locomotive, Class 91, number 91023, named City of Durham. It can easily pull heavy passenger trains at speeds up to 225 kph with its 6480 horsepower engine. On the day of the accident, the train carried a driver, two crew members in the passenger cars, and 99 passengers, a low number due to the early departure, 4.45 a.m., from Newcastle. Going in the opposite direction was freight train 6G34, operated by the Freight Liner Group. The train was traveling from Immingham Docks on the eastern coast to Eggboro Power Station, carrying coal. Each of the 16 cars weighed 102 metric tons, including 74 metric tons of coal. Pulling the heavy train was a British Rail Class 66, also known as EMD Class 66, a diesel-electric freight locomotive introduced in 2000. The Class 66 weighs 129.6 metric tons and is 21.4 meters long. It has a 3,200 horsepower engine, 
allowing it to reach speeds up to 105 kph, even with the heavy loads it usually pulls. On February 28, 2001, at around 6.05 a.m., Mr. Hart was driving his Land Rover Wonder 10 West on the M62 motorway. He was towing a trailer with a Renault Savannah and was in the left lane. As he drove, his car slowly moved onto the paved shoulder, went over the curb, and headed down a grassy slope towards the train tracks. The car and trailer traveled about 115 meters downhill, covering a height difference of around 3.5 meters, and stopped 11 meters south of the M62 bridge. If the car had left the road later or at a sharper angle, the accident might have been avoided because it narrowly missed the safety barrier meant to protect the rail line. The car broke through two small fences and some bushes, causing the trailer to jackknife, where the trailer hits the towing vehicle, and separate. The trailer dug into the soft ground and stopped at the bottom of the slope, while the Land Rover got stuck with its front section on the southbound track. The Renault slipped partially off the trailer, blocking the driver's side door of the Land Rover without being on the track itself. Mr. Hart couldn't move his car off the train tracks, so he got out through the left door, moved away from the cars and the railway, and called emergency services. Meanwhile, the IC-225 train was approaching the overpass from the north at about 210 kph, with 99 passengers on board. Many of the passengers had just boarded 12 minutes earlier at York Station. Junior senior conductor Mr. Robson had just started checking tickets at the front of the train when the DVT reached the overpass. The driver saw the light gray car on the tracks and tried to stop, but he likely knew it was too late. At 6.13 a.m., Mr. Hart's call to emergency services connected. Before he could say anything, the sound of screeching brakes and a deafening crash were heard as the DVT hit the Land Rover at 200 kph. The impact tore the Land Rover in half, spinning it almost one and a half times and ripping the front section off the car's frame. The engine was thrown clear of the wreckage, which spread over 150 meters of railway track. Investigators later found that a piece of debris from the destroyed car likely got under the right front wheels of the DVT, lifting it off the track. If this hadn't happened, there might have been no fatalities and only minor injuries. However, because of this, the derailed DVT started pulling the rest of the train off the tracks at an angle of 6 to 9 degrees. It slowly moved towards the oncoming track, where the northbound coal train just came into view. Due to its high speed, the intercity train passed under Pollington Lane Bridge, a small overpass about 565 meters south of where the DVT hit the Land Rover, as it reached the oncoming track and the coal train. The nose of the DVT, which had slowed to 142 kph, just barely missed the oncoming freight train moving at 86 kph. The freight train's Class 66 locomotive hit the DVT just behind the driver's cabin. The taller Class 66 climbed over the DVT's frame, cutting off the driver's cabin. The DVT's front wheels were torn off and thrown, while part of the Class 66's wheels broke off and pierced the front right side of the first passenger car. Fuel sprayed onto the Intercity's front cars as the broken wheels scraped the Class 66's fuel tank. Both trains derailed further, pulling their cars along. The slowing DVT was hit from behind by the first passenger car, breaking the coupler and shearing off the DVT's rear section. The leading freight car got stuck under the Class 66, lifting its wheels off the ground and turning it into a heavy sledge. The DVT was forced to rotate clockwise, taking Coach M with it and knocking down a support pole for the overhead wire just south of Pollington Lane Bridge. Car H, the second passenger car, hit the underside of the bridge, causing the cars to collide with each other. Car G, the service car, was pushed up against the northern edge of the underpass, flattening the front half and tearing off the roof. The next car's roof was also ripped open. A passenger in car G recalled ordering a coffee when he felt a rumble, saw dust outside from the train derailing, and was violently thrown across the car. He looked up and saw the sky because the roof had been torn off. He survived but the attendant who took his order did not as he was in the crushed part of the car. Both passenger cars were severely damaged and rotated off the track. Within seconds, two large trains, a car, and a trailer with another car 
turned into a 725-meter-long field of debris. Both drivers, two intercity crew members, and six passengers were killed, while 52 passengers survived with severe injuries. Emergency services began arriving at the scene at 6.33 a.m., alerted by Mr. Hart and local residents and survivors. The first to arrive was Humberside Fire Service, responding to Mr. Hart's emergency call about his car being stuck on the tracks and hit by a train. He claimed he didn't know what had happened down the line. He was soon arrested and taken from the scene. Responders set up a temporary headquarters at nearby Heck Hall Farm, where survivors and victims were brought. Two Royal Air Force helicopters from RAF Le Confield and a civilian rescue helicopter helped transport survivors. The large number of responders and the relatively low number of passengers allowed for a quick rescue and recovery operation, with the wreckage cleared by 12.45 p.m. An unusual aspect of the emergency response was the need to set up disinfecting procedures for everyone on site due to the foot and mouth epidemic in the UK at the time. Mr. Hart was charged with 10 counts of causing death by dangerous driving, charges he strongly denied. He claimed a technical fault caused his car to veer off the road and down the hillside. Investigators doubted this, partly because of the angle of the tracks in the grass between the road and rail line. They collected as much of the Land Rover as possible and found only a pierced front tire, which happened when the car broke through a wooden fence on its way down the hillside. The Land Rover ending up on the tracks was found to be the cause of the catastrophe, with neither train driver having any chance to prevent the accident. Both were posthumously cleared of any wrongdoing. The investigation found that Mr. Hart had slept very little the night before the accident, and possibly for several nights, leading to poor concentration and slow reactions. He may have even fallen asleep at the wheel. The investigation showed that if he had applied the brakes when his car first mounted the curb, he would have likely stopped before reaching the train tracks. During the trial, it was revealed that he had spent significant time talking on the phone late at night with a woman he met through a dating agency, which likely caused his lack of sleep. Mr. Hart eventually admitted that there was probably no defect in the car and that he was unfit to drive. On December 13, 2001, he was sentenced to five years in prison and a five-year driving ban. The defense did not contest the ruling, and Hart was released from prison in July 2004, having served half his sentence, with the remaining time turned into probation. He caused controversy by claiming that what happened was fate and that he was meant to be there, just like everyone on the trains. He insisted that he was not at fault for any deaths since no one died when the train struck his car. In his view, he went to jail for driving while unfit to drive, and none of the deaths and injuries were his fault, seeing himself as a scapegoat. During the trial, attention was also drawn to the seemingly insufficient design of the safety barriers along the motorway. It was noted that the Land Rover should not have been able to leave the road 27 meters ahead of the barrier and reach the train tracks with only two minor wooden fences in its path. In 2003, the highway agency reviewed barriers and bridges and found three bridges with inadequate barriers. However, the bridge at Great Heck was not one of them and was deemed sufficient. The Great Heck train crash serves as a stark reminder of how a single moment can change countless lives forever. The bravery of the first responders and the resilience of the survivors continue to inspire us. We want to hear your thoughts on this tragic event. How do you think such disasters can be prevented in the future? Share your views, experiences, and questions in the comments below.